Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. And we begin here at 5 in Grand Rapids where the police officer charged with fatally shooting Patrick Leoya faces a judge for the first time. A judge set bond for Christopher Sure at $100,000 cash or surety as he was formally charged on one count of second degree murder. And if he does post that bond, he's going to follow some very strict rules. Sean Lay is live tonight. Sean Shore had a lot of supporters in that courtroom. And we'll show you, Kimberly, the courtroom was packed with supporters for sure, wearing back the blue t-shirts and t-shirts that read hashtag I stand with sure. Let's take you there. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Sure. No longer in a Grand Rapids police uniform, Officer Christopher Schur wore an orange jumpsuit and a surgical mask as he made his initial court appearance. Schur is charged with second degree murder for the shooting death of Patrick Leoya. Do you understand the charge and the maximum penalty associated with the charge? Yes, sir. It happened during a traffic stop April 4th. Leoya got out of his car, then ran. Then the two struggling for more than two minutes before the officer got on top of Leoya, drew his weapon, and shot him in the back of his head. In announcing the charges Thursday, the Kent County prosecutor explained what the charge of second degree murder is. The elements of second degree murder are relatively simple. First, there was a death, a death done by the defendant, and then when the killing occurred, the defendant had one of these three states of mind, an intent to kill, an intent to do great bodily harm, or the intent to do an act that the natural tendency of that act would be to cause death or great bodily harm. Referring to Schur as Officer Schur in court today, Schur's defense attorney argued that he should be released on bond, indicating Schur's defense for shooting Leoya. Your Honor, the defense submits that Officer Schur on this charge was justified in his use of force in this episode and is not guilty of this crime. Sure was given a $100,000 cash surety bond. Meantime, the courtroom was packed with family and supporters of the officer. Back here live, the judge giving those special conditions of Schur's bond. He's not to have any firearms if he makes bond tonight. No drugs, undergo substance abuse assessment, and not engage in any assaultive behavior. Kimberly, Jason? Okay. Well, Sean, what, what went into the judge's decision to give him a bond then? He did talk a lot about that, and more, most importantly, he said that sure, when he learned of the charges, surrendered right mm -hmm, away. Mm -hmm. Okay, more to come. Sean, we appreciate it. Our other top story here at 5, we're getting our first look at the man charged with fatally shooting an 11-year-old on Detroit's east side. 21-year-old William Dickerson faces second-degree murder and a slew of other charges in the death of Sanaya Pugh. Let's get to Megan Woods, who has the new information in this case. Megan. Yeah, a lot of new information was revealed in court this afternoon, including Dickerson's criminal history. They say that he was on probation for a weapons charge when this shooting happened. Take a look. He's in a house loaded with firearms while on probation for CCW, and then he kills an 11 year old girl and is charged with murder. Allegedly. No matter what the uh, prosecutor says, my client is still presumed innocent. The prosecuting attorney and William Dickerson's attorney went back and forth on what happened the moments leading up to when Sanaya Pugh was shot and killed. And Mr. Dickerson goes into his backyard uh, along with this uh, female juvenile uh, and they fire off rounds uh, toward that wooden fence. The prosecuting attorney explains that the Pew home is on the other side of that fence. The bullet goes right through the fence, a couple of them, including the fatal one. It goes right through the fence, straight and into the back of the house through a window. Uh, where Miss uh, Pugh is uh, struck and she dies. Dickerson's attorney argues there's still no proof it was his client who killed this 11 year old girl. There were a number of people in the backyard, so no one at this time knows exactly who fired the weapon. Ultimately, the judge decided Dickerson would stay in jail. The court does uh, find that Mr. Dickerson is a danger to the community, to society. Dickerson is also facing a careless discharge and four counts of felony firearm charges. The juvenile who was allegedly in the backyard with him shooting, they are awaiting charges. Live in Detroit, I'm Megan Woods, Local 4.
All right, Megan, let's get to the weather now as we go into the weekend and uh, stop me if that looks familiar on radar. <laughs> a line of storms coming across there on Storm Tracker 4 and it really was a gorgeous start to the day with us. Uh, but now obviously we get a little more to deal with. Yeah, we got some uh, storms popping up out there. Let's uh, check in with Brett Collar tracking multiple rain chances too for the weekend, Brett. Yeah, each day features the chance. But with that being said, each day a good deal of dry time as well. We'll get into that in just a moment, but in the meantime, we still have some decent rain falling in some spots. We'll zoom into the Port Huron area and you can see some heavy rain falling. All this moving off to the east. So for those of you in Port Huron, uh, you should start to dry out here shortly. Back out to the west in the Howell area, Livingston County, even some lightning and some thunder out that way as well. Outside of those two areas and one more shower down near Saline, most everybody drying out. If not, you're seeing some light rain at this hour through the evening. The spotty showers will be coming to an end, giving way to what should be a quiet night tonight. But we do have some more active weather for parts of the weekend with some rain and some dry time. And then the heat is on next week. We'll talk about how high the humidity, how high the heat gets rather coming up in just a bit. All right, Brett. He's been booted off the primary ballot, but former Detroit Police Chief James Craig says that's not going to keep him from running for governor. Yeah, Craig says he now plans to run as a write-in candidate for governor in the August primary. Rod Maloney live tonight. Rod, you spoke to Craig a short time ago. What did he have to say? Well, he had a lot to say in the last 45 minutes. We talked to him on the phone. He said, look, he was leading the Republicans in the polls, at times perhaps leading the governor in the polls. He said his message was resonating, and he believes that that's what made him a target in all of this. And this is quoting him. Now, he also says that a lot of people have approached him in the last 24 to 48 hours saying, do not give up. And so he says he won't. And they want me to fight. Uh, they want me to stay in it. And if the right hand is what it's going to require to do it, and so it's not about me as a candidate. Uh, it's more about the people. Chief Craig says he's working with a scaled down staff now. They have much to learn about how to win a write in campaign, but he believes that if Mayor Mike Duggan can do it, he has a shot. It's a heavy lift. I'm not going to say that it's not challenging. It's a big deal. Well, I think it's a really, really high mountain to climb. Local four political analyst Richard Chuba of the Glen Gareth Group says it's more than a heavy lift. He believes the math works heavily against Craig in that one million Republicans voted in the 2018 Republican gubernatorial primary and with five candidates already on the ballot. He would be the sixth running as a write-in. You know, you're going to need you know, I'd say 200 to 250,000 names to be competitive here. Good luck. In the meantime, Craig's campaign may still have trouble in front of them from a former campaign consultant. John Yob tweeted this today. The chief knows his current team hired the alleged forgers long after I left. We are sending cease and desist letters to hold various people accountable for defamation associated with being victimized by this alleged forgery ring. Lawsuits likely follow. I asked the chief about that, about John Yob, and he told me that all he did was ask some questions about how it was that some of the signature forgers, the alleged forgers uh, that worked for his campaign, also worked for Perry Johnson's. He said he insinuated nothing, and he does have the right to ask those questions. So we'll have to see where that all winds up in the days to come. Reporting live, Rod Maloney, Local 4. We'll be watching closely. Rod, thank you. Today, the Biden administration says it is ending the requirement for air travelers to test negative for COVID before entering the country. White House officials say the testing rules will be lifted at midnight Sunday. The CDC says the restriction is no longer necessary based on science and data and will reassess its decision in 90 days. According to the CDC, the testing measure has been in effect since January of 2021. To Washington now and the aftermath of day one of the January 6th hearings during a 90 minute primetime proceeding. The committee laid out what we will learn about events leading up to during and following the attack on the Capitol. Susan McGinnis on Capitol Hill for us with reaction, including what former President Trump has to say about this. Last night's hearing is being described by many as powerful and compelling, and the committee says there's much more to come. In dramatic fashion, the January 6th committee began revealing the results of its 10-month investigation into the Capitol insurrection through never-before-seen video. 300 
uh, Proud Boys. They're marching eastbound. And never before her testimony. I was slipping in people's blood. The committee making its case that Donald Trump engaged in a sophisticated effort to overturn Joe Biden's win. President Donald Trump's intention was to remain president of the United States despite the lawful outcome of the 2020 election. Among revelations, a December 2020 White House meeting with Trump attorney Rudy Giuliani and others. The group discussed a number of dramatic steps, including having the military seize voting machines and potentially rerun elections. President Trump today reacting to his own daughter's admission that former Attorney General Bill Barr was correct that there was no widespread election fraud. Which I told the president was bull****. So I accepted what he said was saying. Trump on social media saying Ivanka was not involved in the election results and had long since checked out. President Biden weighing in today. It's about our democracy itself. We have to protect our democracy. Testifying in upcoming hearings, Georgia's Secretary of State, who will talk about being pressured by Trump to find votes and overturn his state's election results. What you've seen so far, as shocking as it is, is just a fraction of the evidence that we've assembled. The committee promising last night's revelations are only the beginning. The committee says on Monday it will focus on Donald Trump's effort to spread false information about the election. In Washington, Susan McGinnis, Local 4. And what you may not have noticed during last night's hearing is just how prominent a role people from Michigan played. We'll have that part of the story coming up on Local 4 News at 6. Mm -hmm. And we're off and running here on a Friday edition of The Five. Let's check in with Paula Tutman. The Whitmer administration announces a $66 million safety and security package for school districts. We're going to break down exactly what that means for more than 700 school districts. And one of the Great Lakes' busiest shipping lanes forced to shut down. What happened that had the Coast Guard scrambling? And here's Hank. Get ready because the numbers, they are climbing. Gas prices are going to take a big jump very soon. And we have the insider information to let you know just how much we're all going to have to pay. I'm Hank Winchester. Help me, Hank, tonight.